First of all, thanks for being here. Uh, this might be a step out of your comfort zone. So uh, on behalf of evangelical Christians, we're glad you're here. Uh, you're welcome here. Uh, even more important than having a good neighborly relationship with you, we want you to know the awesome God that we have. If there's anything culturally foreign to you here, including my own manners or enthusiasm or even harsh critiques that I express, I'd ask you to express to, uh, to exercise some patience and curiosity in getting to know uh, what most deeply motivates us. Also, thank you, Kweku, for doing this and for uh, collaborating with me as we converged on subtheses to work together on. And uh, also, thanks for proposing and, and insisting on the structure of the debate. Uh, there's a whole generation that's grown up with a really bad taste in their mouth for this kind of thing uh, because of what they've seen on TV or maybe a blowout on a uh, family reunion dinner table over politics. So it's good to normalize structured, public, substantive debate over important issues. Um, I am a born-again Christian. Today I will be uh, promoting, uh, I'll be advocating that God, does, he, that God has glory that he will not share. And the subthesis that I'm going to argue uh, in, in support of that is that we cannot become equal with God in knowledge and power as he is now. We cannot become worthy of worship and that God has predestined his own glory. Uh, I yield my time. You know, 21 years with the name Kwaku, and I think for the first time in my life I've met someone with a name more difficult than mine. Um... <laughs> I'm really thankful to be here. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm really thankful that, Aaron, you opened up your beautiful church to me. It's, it's beautiful in here. I think the lights up there are absolutely gorgeous. I'm a Latter-day Saint. I believe in the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know that we are a small minority in the world, Latter-day Saints. I know that we have some peculiar beliefs, but I believe we have very beautiful beliefs. I know my friends, and I'm confident that Aaron knows his friends as well, and I can say that it's very likely that nobody here is going to leave with their minds completely changed. I don't think anyone here is going to leave converted to another religion. So all I can ask is that if you feel more emboldened and powerful in your faith tonight, that you do something with that. If you feel strengthened as an evangelical, then you should go out and do what a good evangelical would do, and you should make the world a better place. If you feel strengthened as a Latter-day Saint, you should go out and make the world a better place as a Latter-day Saint. We have so many religions in this world. We have so many faiths in this world. But ultimately, what matters in this life, not the next, but in this life, I think God cares a lot about what we do. He cares a lot about how we're helping people. Um, whether you're a Latter-day Saint or an evangelical doesn't really matter to the homeless man or to your friends and family who may be addicted to drugs or things of that nature. What matters is that you're helping them and that your eyes and heart and soul is turned to God. So thank you so much for letting me do this. We cannot become equal with God in knowledge and power as he is now. I will give you three reasons to believe this. Reason number one, scripture says that God has a knowledge that is unattainable, unsearchable, immeasurable, and inscrutable. David says in Psalm 139, verse 4, Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. In 139, verse 6, he says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. And in verse 16, he says, In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. In Isaiah chapter 40, we read, verse 13, Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice? Or taught him knowledge? Or showed him the way of understanding? In verse 28, Isaiah says, His understanding is unsearchable. Now, these two ideas that no one has ever taught God anything and that his understanding is 
unsearchable, which means it's of a, uh, a depth that is inexhaustible. Paul, the apostle, links these two ideas together in Romans chapter 11. He says in verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Reason number two. This God, who has a knowledge that is unattainable and unsearchable and immeasurable and inscrutable, we may know this God personally and truly and intimately. We may have a personal relationship with him. Paul says just verses later in chapter 12, verse 2, he says, Be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And God says in Jeremiah verse 9, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, or the mighty man boast in his might, or the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. And Jesus says in John 17 verse 3, This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, Paul looks forward to a day when we will have this personal knowledge in an uninhibited way. Paul says in verse 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have have been fully known. So this face-to-face, relational, intimate knowledge will no longer be dimmed. Reason number three. Christians have available to them a God-centered eternal progression that makes the cosmic family deity or the regional cosmic patriarch of Mormonism look boring. I have it here in mind, two classical LDS views. The first is that of Brigham Young and uh, Wilfred Woodruff. They taught that all the gods are always progressing in all of their attributes, such that if you reach a point where you know everything that God knows now, he will have since then learned more. Now, Brigham Young condemned the view of Orson Pratt, which was later championed by Joseph Fielding Smith and Bruce McConkie, that all the gods are all equal in their knowledge and power, cease to progress when they become gods in their attributes, but continue to progress in their eternal increase, in their uh, children or their uh, dominions. It's sort of like a cosmic MLM. But Christians instead have an infinite God that has always known everything, and Christians have available to them a God-centered Eternal progression in the knowledge of the immeasurable riches of Christ's grace. Paul says in Ephesians 2 7 that Christ has raised us so that in the coming ages he might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness in Christ Jesus. And Paul prays that believers in chapter 1, verse 18 would have the eyes of our hearts enlightened that we would know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And what is the immeasurable, immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? So, I will never get to the last page of the last book in the library of the knowledge and the grace of God and say, that's it. That's all there is to know. I, too, believe that we will never get to a place in the library of eternity where we find the last page because there is no end, everything continues. There's no, man, there's no end to matter, there's no end to grace, there's no end to priesthood, there's no end to existence. Everything goes on forever. However, I will have to disagree with this notion that we cannot become equal in knowledge with pow- or power with God as he is now. The first thing we need to recognize is that the conversation is impossible without acknowledging each other's belief of the nature of God. When Latter-day Saints say that we will become gods, we do not believe we will become the god like the god of evangelical Christianity. 
We do not believe we will become a spirit with no form or shape. We do not believe we will be a Trinitarian group of spirits. We do not believe we will be a deity that is everywhere. When Latter-day Saints say that they will become gods, we mean the way God is described in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the Book of Mormon, in the Pearl of Great Price, and in the Doctrine and Covenants. We believe we will be people with perfected, glorified bodies, with spirits that will last for eternity. To quote Philippians 3.21, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. We believe we will grow in knowledge, that we will have a greater understanding of the universe and the works of the Father and the Son. It is fair to say that we believe we will have increase, that we will have the power to create and organize. We are children of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, we may be also glorified together. Or to echo 2 Timothy verse 10, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Our belief of becoming gods is doctrinal. It is beautiful, it is consistent, and it is true. I don't think you'll find one Latter-day Saint in this room or in this city who believes he will be completely equal with God when he dies. But you will find Latter-day Saints who believe that we will partake of godhood just as God promised. But we all, with open face beholding, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. Our Father in heaven is our Father in heaven. He will always be our Father. He will always be in front of us. However, we know what we can become. We can become heavenly beings with power, gods. Know ye not that ye shall judge angels, to quote 1 Corinthians 6.3. Then they shall be gods, because they have no end. Therefore shall they be from everlasting to everlasting, because they continue. Then they shall be above all, because all things are subject unto them. Then shall they be gods, because they have all power, and the angels are subject unto them. We believe we will have power, that we will have glorified bodies, but we don't believe we'll be everywhere. We believe that we'll partake and we will reign in heaven, because this is what God has promised. We should all recognize the promises of God, we shouldn't dust them away because we're afraid but because, or because historical Christianity has taught something different. We shouldn't care about what historical Christianity teaches. We should care about what eternal Christianity teaches. The ancient Jews of the Old Testament and the New Testament believed this. They called it apotheosis. Sometimes they called it deification. And today, we just call it becoming like God. It is a historical fact that this is the context in which our scriptures are recorded and written. And it is a fact that this is what our Heavenly Father has in promise for all of those who turn onto his restored gospel and live his faith and trust in the Savior and make covenants and live with them worthily. Caught me a little off guard there because he finished in about three and a half minutes and I, he had six minutes allocated. So we're going to go now to uh, cross-examination. Uh, Aaron will now have um, five minutes to ask questions uh, to Kwaku uh, about uh, anything he wants. Uh, we'll uh, uh, push him a little bit to ask questions as opposed to making statements. And, and then um, after that, Kwaku will have uh, five minutes to ask questions of Aaron and likewise, we'll push him to ask questions as opposed to making statements. Okay. Thank you. We're good? Sorry. Quaku, do you believe that God is still learning right now? Maybe. Uh, can you confirm or deny that God is still learning right now? Okay. Uh, do you believe that God has always known everything? Maybe you got to even, uh, is the mic on? Uh, can you hear, is it on? It's on, all right. Put it closer to my face. Sorry, repeat that. Has God always known everything? 
You know, I cannot speak for God. I can answer that question. In can the you next confirm slide. or deny that God has known everything forever? I can confirm that God is eternal, but I cannot confirm whether God has known everything forever or whether he has not, or what that statement really, really means, known everything forever. Has he been in existence forever? Yes. Has he had the potential to know everything? I, I assume so, but I can't speak for God. Okay. Some in the BYU philosophy department say today that God does not know the definite future. What would be your position on that? Well, I'm not a BYU professor. I go there. Um, I cannot make a statement on open theism. There are about 16 million Latter-day Saints, and most of them don't work at BYU, and most of them have probably never heard of open theism. Sure. So I would say that's, I'll leave that up to the future to determine whether... Is the idea that God does not know the definite future, is that compatible with faithful Mormonism in your view? Can you be an active, faithful uh, uh, Latter-day Saint that's in good faith and not believe that God knows the future? Um, so I think this is a interesting divide here. I, as a Latter-day Saint cannot make the judgments of other people. Only I leave God up to do that. I can, only Christ can make those decisions, okay. right? So I can't decide whether they're faithful or not because only God decides who's truly faithful. If you become a cosmic patriarch someday or a regional uh, family of deity, do you believe that your spirit children will be able to say of you that you have always known everything? Um, I don't know. I don't think I know everything right now. However, we do believe we existed before, and there is a veil before we come to this life, so there is information I knew that I don't know now. Um, so I think speaking on uh, what I knew before or the, you know, the landscape of eternity, I just can't honestly make those statements. Neither can anyone in this room make statements about you know, what they knew before or eternity here. So I can't speak for God, and I can't speak for any information I don't have right now. In Romans chapter 11, Paul celebrates that there's a depth to God's knowledge and that no one's ever known the mind of a Lord, or no one's ever taught him anything. Uh, is that something we, ought, we should worship God for? Um, well, I would ask you to define worship. Uh, to um, ascribe glory to him that is due to his unique character. Ascribe glory. So what does ascribe glory mean? To uh, acknowledge a truth about him with emotions and will and intellect. Okay, so you're, you're acknowledging a truth about God because he knows all. I'm enjoying okay. the, uh, but I'll just state it as a question. Um, in Psalm 139, David celebrates that God knows what's in a book that describes all of his future days. And then David sees this. He says, uh, how you know, precious are your thoughts. Is, should we worship God partly for having a perfect foreknowledge of what he knows about our, our own lives? Yes, yeah, so... God knows what's going to happen. He knows the choices we're going to make. And we are very, very happy about that, right? We, we're very, very excited that our Heavenly Father has a plan for us, that he knows what we're going to do, and that he has laid out a plans and systems that can benefit him. So I think we, can, we should definitely worship him because he knows what's going to happen and he knows everything. Quaker, do you have any personal relationships with people, face-to-face -face personal relationships, that you don't know exhaustively? Yes, do you think that's possible in, in the afterlife with God? To have a personal relationship with him? Um, yeah. But not know everything about him? Correct. Uh, yes, and I think you would agree with that too. Oh, yes. Absolutely. All right. Um, it, Romans 11 says, No one has ever known the mind of the Lord. Would you say that Heavenly Grandfather has completely known the mind of Heavenly Father in your view? Um, Heavenly Grandfather. Oh, boy. That's a term I've never heard before. Um, <laughs> I, if, if, if I get to meet my heavenly grandfather, I'll tell you, I have a lot of questions for him. That's all I can really say. Thank you, Kwaku. Okay, so for my questions here, Aaron. When you die, do you believe that you will only have the knowledge you had in this life and that's it? Absolutely not. I will eternally progress in the knowledge of God and probably uh, creations of God forever. Okay, great. Um, and do you believe that God created all things? Absolutely, outside of himself. Okay, so is it fair to say that because you will increase in the knowledge of God, that you will increase in the knowledge of everything? Uh, no, I, not, not at all. Um, 
personally knowing God. I can have a personal relationship w- with God right now and not know all prime numbers. I, I mean in the next life. Uh, either in this life or the next. Uh, to eternally progress in the knowledge of God forever means that I will never stop learning about God, but it also means there will be an infinite amount of knowledge I'll never know. And that's true in Brigham Young's view, too. Yeah, okay, great. We agree there. Um, do you believe that those who die, who are not Christians or who are not saved in your view, do you believe that they will have, they will have the opportunity to, to partake of knowledge forever or not? No, they will be justly condemned for their sins because they had an accessible knowledge. Romans 1 says, what can be known about God is plain to them in the things that have been made, that his invisible attributes are made in the visible creation. And so Romans 1 generalizes humanity as having been subject to uh, a spiraling downward of sin. And so we need the Lord Jesus Christ to save us from our sins. Do you think there are any exceptions to this? No, none that I know of. Um, May may I propose a few? Uh, No, it's not your turn. (laughs) <laughs> you can ask questions you can't propose. Oh, okay. <laughs> are mentally challenged people are they are mentally challenged people under the same um, constraints that you and I are when it comes to the knowledge of God? I personally believe that any infants who die, for example, or anything mentally equivalent to that, uh, will be brought into heaven, but uh, I would also read Romans 5, that there's a, uh, something that Adam did, a one act of transgression that's imputed to humanity. You've got to factor that in there, too. But if God were to send any uh, human being to hell, he would be just in doing that. Okay, so we would agree that there are some except. Would you agree that there are some exceptions to who goes to heaven? Not among uh, functioning adults. Okay, so... Ch- are children and mentally handicapped people except from this rule? Uh, if they die before uh, having functional uh, moral responsibility. Okay. Am I still good on time? I got about two minutes. Great, thank you. Um, how many children and mentally handicapped people have existed since the fall of Adam? Probably uh, less than the amount of people that were part of the one-third sent to out, outer darkness in Mormonism. Yeah, probably true. Um, probably tens of millions at least. I don't know. Okay, yeah, no, I don't either. Wasn't part of my <laughs> debate prep. <laughs> um, so would you say it is also acceptable that there are tens of millions of those who are not Christians on earth who are in heaven? Not Christians on earth who are in heaven? Yes. Uh, If people didn't have access to the Abrahamic promise, to the special revelation of of the Messiah that was coming, trusting in the revealed promises of God, they will be justly dealt with at final judgment for what they have done on earth. And the Bible paints a very dark picture, the Book of Mormon does too, of people who have a carnal nature uh, who justly deserve uh, forever endless punishment. Yes, the, the celestial spirits. Okay, so... With the question I just asked before, just to sort of reiterate it, um, there are people who are in heaven who did not partake of the Abrahamic promise. Mentally challenged people, children, but there are people, we said perhaps tens of millions. Is that correct? Maybe. Okay, so is that, that's where the line is drawn. Can you find me where that is written in the Bible? No. I, when, you, when you deal with people, what happens to people in the, uh, at final judgment who never reached a functioning adult or some sort of moral respon- ability to do, have moral responsibility, you're going to deal with general attributes of God and make an argument from that. Okay, so you do believe they're in heaven, but you cannot justify this with the Bible. I would argue it on the basis of Romans 2 and how final judgment works. Oh, but it's not plainly written in the no, Bible. neither is it. Yeah. yeah. So Go ahead. just to be clear, these are beliefs that you hold or that you were defending that you cannot back up in the Bible. Uh, there's a kind of pyramid um, or hierarchy of beliefs that I have that I hold strongly or hold uh, relatively more loosely. And I would want to be careful <clears throat> about what I infer from Scripture based on general ideas and what is specifically explicated in Scripture. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Kwaku. We cannot become worthy of worship. I will give you four reasons to believe this. The first is that God boasts in himself. He brags. He promotes himself. He makes a big deal out of himself. 
as one who cannot be likened or compared to another, and as one who has never received what he has from another. In Job 41, verse 11, we read, Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Again, in Isaiah 40, verse 14, Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? In Isaiah 40, verse 25, we read, To whom will you compare me that I should be like him? Have you ever heard of the LDS hymn, Hi to Kolob, where it is sung, Do you think that you could ever, through all eternity, find out the generation where the gods began to be? Well, in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, God says, I am the first, and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. 46, verse 5. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we should be alike? 46, verse 9. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning. And in chapter 48, God explains why he has redeemed a rebellious people. In verse 9, he says, For my name's sake I defer my anger. And for the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. Verse 11. For my own sake, comma, for my own sake, comma, I do it. For how should I let my name, for how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. Reason number two. We cannot boast in ourselves. While nothing that God has, he received, and he boasts about that, everything we have, we received. In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7, Paul says, What do you have that you did not receive? If you received it, why do you boast as though you did not receive it? Also, God saves sinners by grace, not by works, so that they can't boast in themselves. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we read, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is, this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Reason number three. God's people boast joyfully in God. In Psalm 34, verse 2, we read, My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. 95 verse 3. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. 97 verse 9. You are exalted far above all gods. 113 verse 4. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like our God? 115 verse 1. Not to us, O Lord. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and faithfulness. Reason number four. Because all things are from God and through God and to God. All, any glory or inheritance or honor that we receive from God is to be redirected back to God. Again, in Romans 11 verse 35. Who has given a gift to him? That he might be repaid for, from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And we see this in the book of Revelation. Where those on the thrones around the one who is on the throne take all the honor and the glory that has been given to them. And they redirect it back in, back in worship. Revelation 4, verse 10, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their thrones before, sorry, they cast their crowns before the throne. Therefore, Christians do not have a localized cosmic family deity that is downstream from an ancestry of God's or who was given what he has by heavenly grandfather. Nor do we have a regional cosmic patriarch that is God only, only over one generation of one branch of the family tree of the gods. We are redeemed not to become worthy of worship, 
not to boast in ourselves over future spirit children. Rather, we are redeemed to joyfully boast in the Most High God, the first and the last, the one who can't be likened or compared to any other, who never received what he has from another. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. For the record, um, I don't think it's fair to say that Latter-day Saints boast of their future spirit children. Um, It's hard for me to even keep a girlfriend. Um, I think it's important to put historical context in the Bible. If you remove context from the Bible, guess what? You can make it say whatever you want to say. That's just the reality of it. And we see that with all the different denominations we have. When we read the verses, especially in Isaiah, where God says, and he's, he's boasting about himself, where he says, there are no other gods like me, there are nothing else beside me, I'm the only God. You're exalted above all other gods. Well, I'm going to ask you a question here, guys. Does it make sense to say to your dad, you are the best dad above all the Santa Clauses? Does that make any sense? No. Do you know why it doesn't make sense? Because you're, you're comparing your father to something that you say doesn't exist. That language is used for a reason. Do you know why? Because the historical context we know as a fact, not for opinion or debate, but as a fact, is that the Jews of the Old Testament and the New Testament were not monotheists. They just weren't. In fact, I would like to note that the terms monotheism and the term polytheism come from a man named Philo of Alexandria. His teachings post-date the New Testament, period. In fact, the entire concept of monotheism, polytheism, are not biblical terms. They're not of the biblical era. So applying that logic to the Bible is disingenuous. In fact, I would love to um, quote a non-LDS, a non-LDS Christian scholar named Saul Olyon. He said, in a word, the rhetoric of divinity is no longer applied to the members of the host of heaven. Evidently, in order to bring in the relief of Yahweh's incomparability and unique power and agency among non-obvious beings, yet the host remain a heavenly reality for a second Isaiah nonetheless, continuing to act on Yahweh's behalf as they have always done. Some other language that's important from the exact time of the Isaiah period and the New Testament period is from Egypt, the best record keepers in world history. A lot of people will read the verses of the Old Testament and they will assume that there's nothing else there, that it's just that, and they won't look into any of the context. The great Cairo hymn to Amun-Ra says, unique one, like whom among the gods? Literally, like whom of the gods? You are the sole one who made all that exists, one alone who made that which is. Single unique, without his second. Unique king, like whom among the gods? Father of the gods. He's also called the chief Aeneid. Now, Of course we know that the Egyptians believed in more gods than Amun-Ra. This is just a fact. Why would they use this language? And why would they use it in the Bible? Let's read some more. How about that? Um, Tale of Sunni. He is a god without equal with none in existence preceding him. Interesting. The same language used in the Bible is used in the exact same cultures in the surrounding areas. Um, I think it's important to think about this. It's also important to note this right here. By the way, don't ever print double-sided. What a terrible (laughs) idea. Uh, (laughs) How manifold are your deeds, though hidden from sight, sole God apart from whom there is no other. I would ask you, why did God say that there are no other cities besides the city of Nineveh or the city of Babylon? Are there no other cities besides those cities in the Bible? Well, of course there are. But he's saying there are no other cities like Nineveh. None as wicked as Babylon. No cities like. In the same way the Jews say there are no gods like you, Yahweh, Elohim. There are none like you. You exalted above them, but they are there. The historical facts are that they believed in them, and Latter-day Saints also believe in other gods. Therefore, it makes sense with the knowledge of the restoration and with historical context that we can become like God. When we say we will be worshipped, we don't believe 
that we're just like God, but we believe that worship is to emulate Jesus Christ, to emulate perfection. And when we reach perfection and reign with him, guess what? We believe that people, our spirit children perhaps, may be following in a path of perfection, and that is worship. Worship is not just having your hands up in the air during a great Christian song. Worship is not trying to direct all your thoughts to God because you'd fail. Worship is trying to emulate. Worship is repenting. Worship is praying. Worship is covenanting with. That is worship. That is the true nature of worship. And that is what we Latter-day Saints strive to do. And spirit children that may come, that is what they will try to do. That is the eternal order. Thank you. Aaron, I'm going to ask you one of your favorite questions. Do you believe God ever sinned? Never. Never. Okay. Aaron, do you believe that God created everything? Everything outside of himself. Okay. Do you believe that God created Satan? Yes, as an angelic, perfect, holy being that fell. Yeah, yeah. It was actually Lucifer before it was Satan. And it? to support that, in Colossians 1, it says, Jesus Christ himself created all things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers or authorities. It's the exhaustive language that Paul goes for, which is inclusive of Satan. Yes, yes. So, do you believe that God created sin? No, he has a way of ordaining that sin be without himself directly creating sin. Uh, he has a way of ordaining that things come to pass like sin. So sin isn't a material it's a derivative of good things. So God only creates physical material? No, he creates spiritual beings too. Okay. But he, he didn't create any spiritual being sinful. Right. So is sin a part of everything? A part of everything. A, a, is it not a part, a part of everything? It's a twisting of what God originally created. Does it exist within existence? Sure. And it's held in existence. God created all of existence. Uh, yeah, and then it fell. Okay, so, so my issue here is that, um, I'm, I'll put a question mark, don't worry. My issue here is that if God created everything and created existence, you're adding this little clause, but. But he didn't create sin, that, that was twisted, that came afterward. But if it's a part of everything, is it fair to say that God created sin? No. Uh, we want to say not less than scripture or not more than scripture, but... In Romans 11, Paul says, all things are from him and through him and to him, to him be the glory. The amazing thing about Paul saying all things are from him in Romans 11 is that Paul just got done talking about how God hardened the Jews to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. So God has a way of ordaining that sin would be without himself being sinful and without himself directly creating sin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you would say that God did not create sin. Not directly, no. Uh, I don't care about directly or not directly. Did God create sin? I'll hand you a statement that you might uh, appreciate or use. God is the decisive and ultimate cause of all things. Did God create sin? He is the decisive and ultimate cause of all things. Okay. He did not tempt everyone, anyone. He did not directly create sin. In interesting. Okay. Um, I want to pose this question to you. If you sell a man a gun, um, is it, if you illegally sell a man a gun, I don't want to start a horrible <laughs> argument here. If you illegally sell a man a gun, is that right or wrong? Uh, wrong. It's legal. Okay. Um, if you supply that man with bullets, is it, would you say that's a sin? If it's illegal? Yeah. Yeah. I'd be disobeying the law and the law is probably there for a good purpose. Okay. Now, if that man kills someone... Did you inadvertently play a role in that man killing someone? Yeah. Okay. Um, so not by, in the same way, not in the same morally culpable way. But but you you did play a role. Small role. Okay. I mean, a smaller role than the murder itself. There's a direct. Act. Oh, of, of course, of course, of course. Um, I but are, my, my my error would be the illegal supplying of the weapons. It would not be the. I, I cannot take blame for another person's um, misuse of the tools I give them. But you, in a sense, helped create this situation. With God, it's even, so to speak, worse. All the tools that we need to fall, uh, the, the, the garden, uh, the, the, the tree with the knowledge of good and evil, permitting Satan to enter the garden, uh, God uh, had a plan for all this. 
And it's part of the plan. So God did put Satan in the garden. Would you he say put, that? I don't know if he put Satan in the garden, but he allowed him to enter it. Okay. He didn't stop him. Um, so, okay, 45 seconds here. Um, Goes by To quick. borrow your language from earlier, if God created everything, God created the devil, devil created sin, does that make God the grandfather of sin? God is the decisive and ultimate cause of all things without himself being sinful and without himself being a direct creator of sin. Indirect creator of sin. He is indirectly, he is, he is the decisive and ultimate cause of all things, so much so that Paul says in Romans 11, all things are from him. Sin would not be if God did not allow it to become into being. Sin would not persist if God did not allow it to persist. Okay, thank you. Kwaku, if you have spirit children someday, and they say of you as you speak, this is the voice of a god and not the voice of a mere man, will that be appropriate? What would be your response? It will be appropriate to say that, because I will be a god and not a mere man. Do you know what I was quoting? No, I don't. Please. Okay, uh, please, okay, uh, I, 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 okay. In, in, uh, in Acts 12, uh, I, I, I'll ask, talk about it later. Do you believe that Heavenly Father was once perhaps a sinful mortal before he became a god? You called that one. Um, I don't know. Okay. Do you believe that God has the right to boast in himself? Yes, yes. Do you believe that if you become a god, you will have the right to boast in yourself? Um, well, I think we need to define what... Define will you have the right to for... boast in yourself in the same way that God has the right to boast in himself right now, that, which you already affirmed? I can't say that because I don't know if I'll be supplying a savior to people or not. Can you confirm or deny that you will su supply a savior? I cannot confirm okay. or deny that, no. In Nehemiah 9.6, I'll read this, um, but insert your name if you don't mind. You are the Lord Kwaku, you alone. You made the heaven, the heaven and heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is in it, the sea and all that is in them, and you preserve them, and the host of heaven worships you, Lord Kwaku. Will that kind of language be appropriate by your spirit children someday, perhaps, of you? Well, when we, like I said, what does worship mean? Worship means to try to follow and emulate what is perfect. And God has told us that when we are in heaven, we will be perfect. So if they are following after perfection, then they are worshiping me. But I don't, I, when I think of spirit children, I don't imagine anyone bowing to me or making statues of me or putting crosses up of me. Can you imagine them worshiping you in the same way that you worship your heavenly father? Um, no, because I, no one can imagine anyone worshiping God in the same way. We, you worship God in a different way than I do, than Bob does, and your evangelical friends in here. We all worship God in a different way try this. Um, in a previous version of Gospel Principles, it was said in the Exaltation chapter that when we have spirit children, they will have the same kind of relationship that we have. As, they will have the same kind of relationship with us as we have with our Heavenly Father. Was that irresponsible of them to publish? No, I mean, it's true. If we have spirit children, they'll be our children. They will relate to you like you relate to your Heavenly Father? Y yes, yeah. And you yeah. have a relationship of worship with your Heavenly Father, is that true? Yes. Okay, will they have a relationship of worship with you? Your, um, your spirit children, perhaps? Well, they didn't include the word worship in there. I think that's, I think that's imposing a bit. And, so, and that quote you give, they did not include the word worship. Sure, but will they have the same kind of relationship with you that you have with your, with your Heavenly Father? Yes, in the way that they will be creations. It's spirit, they will be children, and I am a father. That's, it's like saying, do, does, do your neighbor's children have the, a relationship with their father as you have a relationship with your children? Well, of course, because you're their father, and he's their if father. If your spirit children start worshiping you, Will you redirect it to your heavenly father? Um, if my spirit children are worshiping in as much as worship means following in the path of righteousness. and In repenting, the same way that you worship heavenly father. Um, yes, in the same way that I worship heavenly father, repenting, having trust in faith, repenting, trying to be better, following like the savior. Then yes. If your spirit children sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord quake who almighty, who was and is and is to come. Will that be appropriate? Um, I, 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 I don't, <laughs> if I'm a god and people are singing about me, um, I, you know, I just, I can't, right now I can't put a firm opinion on future 
rock songs that will describe me when I'm a god. So is it safe to say you can neither conform or deny yet that your spirit children will worship you in the same way you worship your heavenly father? Like I said, I think relationship with God is very personal. No one has the same relationship with God, so I'm not going to go and say that they will have the exact same relationship with God that I have with God. Kwaku, if you go to a family reunion of the gods and your your, uh, spirit ancestors are there, your heavenly grandfather and your spirit uh, uncles and your spirit great uncles, and you're around at a table and someone approaches, enters the room and says, is the most high in the room? Who should stand up? Who should be summoned? You know, I, I, I've heard a lot of hypothetical examples. Um, I, if, if, I am at, if I'm in a family reunion with a bunch of gods, a bunch of heavenly beings, and someone says, who is the most high? I will say, my heavenly father. Okay, and will you be able to say of your heavenly father in a room with uh, billions of other uh, beings of equal or greater power and knowledge that there is none like yours? Um, even though time's up, can I answer that? Would that be okay? Um, in the same way that the Bible and um, the Book of Mormon praise God as being alone, like the quotes I read earlier, it will be in that same way. There is no God like my Heavenly Father. There is no God like my Heavenly Father. There is no dad like you, Aaron. God predestined salvation for his own glory. I will give you five reasons to believe this. Reason one, all the individuals that were involved in the murder of Jesus Christ did whatever God's hand and plan had predestined to take place. In Acts chapter 4, verse 27, For truly in this city were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Reason number two, God chose and lovingly predestined people for adoption to himself through Christ to the praise of his glorious grace. In Ephesians 1, uh, verse 4, we read, He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace. In verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glorious grace. Verse 13, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Paul is obsessed with this. The ultimate reason God chose and lovingly predestined people to be adopted to himself through Christ and to be sealed with the Holy Spirit is, verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace. Verse 12, to the praise of his glory. Verse 14, to the praise of his glory. Reason number three, God freely chose children of the promise. God freely chose children of the promise, not because of works they would do, but because of his call and to further his purpose. In Romans chapter 9, verse 13, sorry, verse 11, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, The older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. God's free choice of the children of the promise does not depend on human will or exertion. Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then... It depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Reason number four, God hardens whom he wills, and he gives mercy to whomever he wills to further the proclamation of his name. 9 verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth, 
So then, verse 18, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Reason number five. God acts as a potter over clay to show his wrath and show his power and show his mercy. Verse 19, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Therefore, the cross was not plan B. It was, like Paul says in Ephesians 3, 11, according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. God chooses a people and lovingly predestines them for adoption to himself in Christ and seals them with the Holy Spirit, Paul says, to the praise of his glorious grace, to the praise of his glory, and to the praise of his glory. God chooses children of the promise, in a manner that is not dependent on human will or exertion, but instead according to his purpose of election, which is to show his wrath and make known his power and proclaim his name, and finally, to make known the riches of his glory in giving mercy. We praise God in difficult times, not because he predestined difficult things to happen to us, but we praise him because he made it work for the best. I think every person in here knows when you go through a difficult time, do you sit down on your knees and do you thank God and say, I'm so thankful that you predestined this to happen? Or do you ask for, for you know, power? Do you ask for wisdom to be able to keep faith as you go through it? Um, I've, been, I've been very nice tonight, so allow me to get a little bit harsh, but no, I still love you all. Joshua 24, 15 says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Joshua tells us to choose. Many of you know that the doctrine of predestination or predeterminism finds free agency or free will to be heresy. That choice is not okay. That choice doesn't happen. That everything is predestined to happen. God makes every single thing happen. I'm going to give a bit of a summary of what predeterminism and predestination is, and I'll let you decide for yourselves. Choice is an inevitable part of life. Everyone makes choices. For God to predestine salvation is to remove the purpose of being alive. To believe in predeterminism is to believe that God was isolated, alone in the plethora of nothingness. Although, to be fair, isolation and loneliness can only exist with the knowledge that there would be another person there, but he, anyway, he was somewhere alone, and he wanted to prove he was sovereign and powerful, so he created people, and he, the creator of the world, was insecure, so he specifically designed some people to make it to heaven and some people to make it to hell, most people to make it to hell, so they could see that he had power to send them to hell because he created them, and this glorified him, the fact that he could send them to hell for that purpose. However, the doctrine of predestination doesn't end there. In this doctrine, God predestines every single thing to happen. He predestined this debate to happen. He predestined President Obama to be leader of the free world in 2008. And he predestined Donald Trump to be president of the free world in 2016. God predestined everything. God predestined the death of every Jew and homosexual and gypsy in the Holocaust. God predestined every rape of a young girl sold into sex trafficking. God predestined all of my ancestors to be stricken of their freedom and to be murdered. God predestined all of these things because it glorified him. I want to ask you a question. Does this sound like the God you worship? Not one person in here is going to look a sex trafficked girl in the eyes and say yes. Not one person. Do you know why? Because you all know in your heart, and I know in my heart, that God values choice and agency. That God does not predestine 
wicked things to happen. That God does not choose who's going to go to heaven or hell before they exist. We all know that. We have to convince ourselves that it's opposite of that. But everyone in here knows that that's the truth. The Lord sent his Savior for us to die for us. And he said, for God so loved the world. Not so for God so loved the predestined. Not for God so loved the elect. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Each and every person has a shot. This idea and this doctrine of predestination has been a very, very violent doctrine. Um, um, for example, which doctrine was primarily used by Calvinists to justify colonialism? Do you know what doctrine played a very heavy part? Predestination. Because the pagan Native Americans were predestined to be wiped out. They were predestined to be murdered and raped because Christianity needed to be brought to the land. The same people are the same ones who accused little girls of being witches, tied them to stakes, and lit them on fire in the witch trials that were so prominent in America and in Europe. And Mr. John Calvin himself, the creator of this doctrine, looked the other way while his people massacred many people. This doctrine is a violent, dark, pernicious doctrine. And I would wager that it seems immoral and dumbfounding to claim that anyone who is a Latter-day Saint is not a true Christian because he believes that he will have a glorified body, that he will have knowledge that will go on forever, that he, can, he will be able to create and reign with God, as God says. To say that that is not Christian, but to believe that God predestines things like the Holocaust and rape, that is shocking. To say Mormons believe in a different Jesus, I would wager that this is a different Jesus, far more radical than any Jesus proposed. God does not predestine sin. To believe in predestination is to also believe in predestined sin. That he predestined Satan to do what he did. That he predestined Adam and Eve to fall. To believe that God created all things and predestined all things is to believe in the predestination of sin. That is the reality. That is how logic works. We all know that. We can try to, you know, create these different things in our head to make it seem that that's not the case, but we all know that's the case. This doctrine is not true. God foreordains. He does not predestine. He foreordains prophets and apostles. God foreordains each and every single one of us with agency to follow the Savior and feel the Spirit, but he does not predestine one person to fail. That is not the doctrine of God, and every person in here feels that that is true in some aspect. Amen. What would you say is the most dramatic and spectacular sin that ever happened in human history? When people wear Crocs, no, uh, the, fall of, <laughs> the fall of Adam and Eve. Okay, second? The second most mm -hmm. grand sin? Mm -hmm. um, oh boy, I would say that's up to interpretation, but I would probably say the second most grand sin was the betrayal of Christ by Judas. Okay. Uh, would you say that the murder of Jesus Christ was a sin? Oh, absolutely. Okay, in, in Acts chapter 4, verse 27, we read earlier that uh, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod, Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Uh, how, do you, how do you deal with that with respect to this idea that God has never predestined a sin? Well... Let's, let's, let's use the, the true biblical meaning for predestined. Um, we, we, we know that, for example, the word foreknew is often translated to loved. The word predestined does not, does not mean what it means in the, the European English sense of predestined. He, he anointed them. He, he put them in positions. He let things come to pass. Um, however, he let, he let them use their agency. Pontius Pilate was clearly making a choice. Mm -hmm. Very clearly making a choice. But they were doing whatever, it says, his hand and his plan had predestined to take place. So mm -hmm. it wasn't just individuals. How do you see this passage where it says, to, where it speaks to the actions having been predestined? Well, I think the Lord knew what was going to happen. For example, he knew that Christ had to be crucified. He knew that we, we needed a savior. Every so why, didn't, single... why didn't Luke just, or why didn't they just say that? 
I, I think they did when you read it in harmonization with all the other scriptures. When you isolate it alone, you can make it say whatever you want. But when you put it with the rest of the Bible, it's very clear that that's what Luke said. So that m- merely, as he narrates this, that God knew he would be crucified, but that the crucifixion wasn't planned? No, of course the crucifixion was planned. Uh, Book of Mormon testifies of that in a really great way. Crucifixion was planned. However, God didn't make robots. He didn't make these robots to go and, all right, you're going to do this and this and this and this and this, and then you're going to crucify Jesus, and then I'm going to send you to hell. I made you that way, and that glorifies me. That's not how it works. He let people choose. However, he knew he knows Satan's plan. He knows what Satan's going to do, and he knows that certain things have to come to pass, so he makes it all work for that good. Why did Jesus say that Judas must go and be his betrayer? Because Judas had a sinful, wicked heart. What did Jesus say, though, in the four Gospels? What was his explanation for... Uh, could you quote it for I'm me? I'm sorry. Uh, Jesus explains the betrayal uh, of him by Jud- Judas. How does Jesus explain Judas's betrayal of Jesus? I don't know. Can, can you quote this for me? Uh, that he, he was the do- one doomed to destruction, and that it, it had been better if he had never been born. Uh, in Mark 14, verse 21, the Son of Man goes as, as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. Yes, yeah. Okay, can you, can you find a word in there or a, a sentence in those scriptures that say Judas was predestined to do what he did? He was doomed to destruction would be the language. Doomed to destruction because he chose wickedness? Uh, that he was, uh, yeah, he was doomed to destruction when he betrayed the Savior. That's when he was doomed to destruction. Not beforehand? Um, were those four Gospels written as the things were happening? It's irrelevant. No, I'm, I think I'm asking very... the questions, though. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> right. Okay. okay. Who's, who sent the Assyrians to do judgment on Israel, according to the Old Testament? Um, is the right this is answer, a softball. Sorry. Is the right answer God? Uh, yeah, if you, okay. if you read the prophets. <laughs> who sent the Babylonians to do judgment on Judah? Uh, God. Who punished the Assyrians after they put judgment on Israel? God. Who punished the Babylonians after they rose up to do punishment, to do, uh, punishment on, on Judah? God. Okay, do you remember the story of uh, Joseph being betrayed by his brothers, uh, being sold into slavery? Um, he's in Egypt in a favorable position, and he meets his brothers again later. He says to his brothers, you meant evil for me, against me, but God meant it for good to bring about it so that any people should be kept alive. Do you believe that God meant what happened to Joseph? Yes, I think when we, when we use the word meant to happen, we, we, I think most Christians mean allowed it to happen for good. But not that God was very adamant and happy that this happened, but he lets sure. these things happen for the good of Joseph. Okay. Thank you, Quaker. Who is the man that the majority of scholars and historians hold to be the founder and creator of the doctrine of predestination? Man, this is before Paul. I don't, I don't know. The, the, the majority of, of real of scholars, of, of people right now, if, if I were to write a university paper, who, who would I gather the information from? Who, who, would, who would be the unified answer among serious scholars as the creator of the doctrine of Calvinism? I don't think, or, <laughs> I don't think anybody would seriously say that John Calvin invented the doctrine. I, I think most would. I think most absolutely certainly would. I think most Christians would None as well. of the reformers before him. Um, I think some Sorry of to them, ask a question. Sir. I, I think John Calvin really capitalized on it, but I think every historian, most historians would. Sorry, yeah. Okay. I'm just trying to get the honest answer of John Calvin. Um, do you think that certain people are doomed from the womb to certain destruction? Judas. Mm-hmm. Do you think that anyone it in this room... It would have been better if he had never been born. Oh, no, I agree. Do you think anyone in this room has free agency? If that means the ability to will what you most want, yes. If that means to act independently of the purposes of God, no. If that means to act independently of God as being the decisive and ultimate cause of all things, no. Okay. Do you think that anyone in this room has free choice? Define it for me and I'll answer it better. I'm not trying to evade the, it. The ability to choose what they want to do. So there's two classical views of freedom that I know of. There's libertarian free will and compatibilist free will. Mm-hmm. Take a compatibilist view that I can freely choose what I most want. 
that I can will what I most want. What I don't have the power to do is change my fundamental most desires as a fallen creature. Mm -hmm. I don't have ability to change my nature so deeply that I have a different kinds of desires. Um, did God predestine everything to happen? Ephesians 1, I think it's 12, he says he works all things after the counsel of his will, and that he predestined us um, according to that. Is sin predestined? Absolutely, the, including the sin of the murder of Jesus Christ, including all the sins that somehow God is able to use for our good. He works all things for the, for the good of those who love them, for those who are called according to his purpose. Do you think all things glorify God? Ultimately, in an ultimate way, uh, Romans 11 says, all things are from him and through him and to him, to him be the glory forever and ever, amen, including the, the mass rebellion of the Jews against Jesus. Paul even says that was to ultimately God's okay. glory. Do you think, okay, so the answer to that is yes, God, like everything glorifies God, okay. Uh, do you think even the bad things that have happened in the world glorify God? Ultimately, by way of justice, by way of providential working. Do you think that the Holocaust glorifies God? God has found a way to make, God did not, that was not a part of plan B. That was plan A. Holocaust was plan A. All things work together for good. All things ultimately work for his glory, and the Holocaust included. Jesus can stare Satan straight into the eye when he is at the dinner table in the upper room who is in Judas and say, go do what you're going to do quickly. Jesus has absolute sovereign control. Satan is on a leash. Um, Satan's not on a leash if he's performing the Holocaust, let me tell you that. Um, would you agree with this quote? Thieves and murderers and other evildoers are instruments of divine providence being employed by the Lord himself to execute judgments which he has resolved to inflict. That's literally basically what God says in Romans 9 about Pharaoh and other vessels set aside for destruction. That's, that's Pharaoh was actually. raised up to show his power, and he was a subject to God's irresistible will, and yet he was still blamed for what he did. That's literally the argument of Paul in Romans 9. Oh, that's actually a quote from... Mr. John Calvin, it's, uh, it's it's not the same quote from Romans. He would have gotten that from Romans nine. No, I I definitely think he 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 pulled it, but I think uh, I think it's a little change. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Just um, put a question mark. <laughs> question mark, right? Um, things that are wicked are. I have to phrase this question. Do you think that Mormonism was predestined? Yes including all pagan religions, Canaanite fertility cults, those old and those that have been reinstantiated for the 21st century. God, d does God find glory in creating someone with the knowledge before they existed that they're going to hell? Yes. And, and your God has to, uh, has to deal with that issue too if he has perfect foreknowledge. I, I've asked all my questions. Thank you. First of all, thank you to Quaku for being here. Um, thanks for doing the hashing out. And uh, I, I know Quaku not super well, but I know you well enough to know that um, this wouldn't stop us from being able to hang out and talk as acquaintances and friendly acquaintances at that. Um, or even friends, maybe. I don't know. Um, so, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'd be glad to buy you a coffee sometime, or post them, whatever. Um, <laughs> just add, put a pop, pop a caffeine pill in it. Still word of wisdom compliant. <laughs> Thank you to the crowd for being here. I know this. Anyway, just thanks for being here. Thanks for being a part of this. On scoring or analyzing the debate, I want to give you a tip on how to do that. In John 17, verse 18, sorry, John 7, verse 18, Jesus says, The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true. And in him there is no falsehood. So Jesus' idea of being a truth teller or discerning who is a truth teller, has to do with whether or not you speak of your own authority or whether you appeal to the words of somebody else's authority. It has to do whether or not you are seeking your own glory or seeking the glory of the one who sent you. So a good uh, way to discern who's the truth teller here is who is seeking ultimately the glory of God and who is appealing to the words of what God has spoken. Secondly, just to make it super clear, to worship any other God than the first of all gods, to worship any other God than the Most High, is idolatry. It's blasphemy. It's exchanging the truth about God for a lie. It's settling for something less, for something pathetic. 
And Jesus Christ will come back someday. We have proof of that by his resurrection of the day. And he will judge the living and the dead. So, if you worship your cosmic divine patriarch or family deity that's only over one generation of one branch of the family tree of the gods, repent. Repent. And worship the first one. The first of all the gods who's exalted far above all gods. Who has no heavenly grandfather above him, and so to speak. Secondly here, or lastly here, if you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and you repent of your idolatry and you repent of trusting it in your own righteousness and you trust in what Jesus has done on the cross, any shame associated with having had a cosmic family deity for a God or a regional cosmic patriarch for a God, any shame associated with that won't come with you. If you repent to the Lord Jesus Christ, because Jesus took the shame like that, idolatry, and he put it on himself on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. I call upon you to repent of your idolatry and trust in God who will take the shame of your idolatry and transact it to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm standing here in an evangelical church, I'm not standing here in a Presbyterian church or a Methodist church, certainly not a Catholic church, and certainly not an LDS church, but I am here because I have a testimony of God's truth. I'm here because I have a testimony that Christ is the Savior, that he was foreordained to be the Savior, that he's a Savior of the world, metaphorically and physically. I have a testimony of these things and I know these things by the Spirit. We live in a world in which our beautiful, holy, cherished Bible is picked apart, it's mocked, it's scoffed at, and it's lied about. We live in a world in which people remove context, whether they be scholars or pastors. They lie to congregations, they remove historical precedents, and they craft narratives. Sometimes. These narratives are crafted to do wicked and bad things. Luckily, the Lord did not let this happen forever. The Lord did not let this go on forever. Although the witch trials were abominable, it weren't the end game. Although slavery instituted by many Christians happened, it wasn't the end game. Although Jews and Muslims were tortured in the Vatican during the Inquisition, it was not the end game. Although many churches came to be and split apart and fought and murdered each other, it was not the end game. The end game is the second coming of Jesus Christ. He restored his gospel through a man named Joseph Smith and gave us what is known as the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrine and Covenants. Many may say that the true beliefs are heresy. Much of the Christian world may look at the Latter-day Saints and say, you are different, your beliefs are not consistent with what we were taught. And those who say that echo the Jews who rejected Christ in the New Testament. They did not accept the continuing, the continuing revelation. They did not accept God's continuing word. They rejected it. And they sided with a man who murdered their Savior. Do not repent of what is true. Do not repent of the restored gospel which God has given us. But rejoice in it. And if you feel the whisperings of the Spirit prompt you to read a book such as the Book of Mormon, do not turn those promptings away, but listen to them. The Holy Spirit is what guides a man, and he guides us through our hearts. He doesn't always guide us through our minds because our minds are faulty, but he guides us through our hearts, and that's the way it's set up. I could list all the proof of the Book of Mormon if I wanted to. I could sit up here and rant about Nahum. I could rant about about fortresses found by National Geographic. I could do all these things, but I don't because God is more powerful than anything I can say. So I invite you to come unto Christ. Thank you. Uh, Because this is pretty relevant, I'll start with Kwaku. Uh, Why do Mormons say that as man is, God was, and as God is, man may become? Um, so that's, that's um, a little couplet by, I believe, President Lorenzo Snow. Um, we say that because it, it echoes, in a nice way, the idea of eternal life and of reigning in heaven. You know, 
the, the scriptures tell us, Heavenly Father tells us that we can become like God, that we can reign with him, that we will, we will judge angels, that we have power in the next life. So we don't actually believe we're going to become literally our Heavenly Father. We believe we will have glorified bodies, we'll increase in intelligence, we'll increase in power and wisdom. Um, so I think it, that's, that's what it means. It means that we can become gods. So uh, just to follow up to that, does that mean that God was a man walking around on an earth, uh, died, and was sinful? I mean, wh- wh- what are the implications from that then? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll pose this. Um, by, by a raise of hands. Can I do a raise of hands? Is that all right? Is that sure. all, right? all right? Okay, great. By a raise of hands, who believes that Jesus is God in here? All right. Who believes that Jesus was a man? Okay. Who believed that God was a man? Interesting, right? Jesus is God. Jesus is a man. Is God a man? Oh, nope. You can't raise your hand for that, even though you know naturally that's the next conclusion. But there's just this, like, fear of, oh, my gosh, I say that. Is that heresy? Am I going to hell? But we all believe that God became man. So if Jesus is the perfect example of Heavenly Father, the perfect example of Heavenly Father on earth, did Heavenly Father do that? I can't give the answer. Not all Mormons can. However, to just reject it and say that isn't true, I don't think that's, that's an honest look into your faith. I don't think it is. Okay. Thank you. Um, Aaron, I, you uh, asked the question about worship quite a few times. Uh, uh, holy, 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 uh, Lord God Almighty. Uh, in, uh, and, and I'm going to be geek here just for half a second. Uh, the, the word for saint in Greek is the word hagias. The word for worship in Greek is also for holiness in Greek is also hagias, the same word. So Paul says when he addresses the congregations, when he writes the letters, he writes to the holy ones, right? So Paul actually addresses the saints, the, the very title of the saints is to the holy ones. If, so when Peter was told to go to the Gentiles, and he said, oh, I've never eaten with those unclean ones, he was told by the angel, by God, what I have called you to go do, don't call them unclean. So how is that any different than the Latter-day Saints saying that they, when they're exalted to be called holy would be blasphemous? Because not only the holiness that we are given, the glory that we're given, the honor that we're given is a received holiness and a received uh, glory and honor. So when we say God alone is holy, that's scriptural language too, you alone are holy, what we're saying is that he has a kind of superlative, categorically different holiness that is in and of himself that was never given to him, that is infinite, that we may uh, participate in and derive from, but never exhaustively become equal to. Um, So we will always say, um, the Christians are called the saints, the holy ones, but God is called the holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And what's awesome about the incarnation, just real quickly to change the subject, is it's not that, the issue isn't that God became a man. It's that man became a God. That's the dividing line. It, it's not that uh, Christ came to the earth and became a man. Um, it's the idea that in, pre-mor- that in some previous existence that, he was once not God, and he had to become a God, or the, fa- the Father did so. So that He would have, in that sense, received a holiness and received a glory, and that is categorically different from the God of the Bible. Okay. Yeah, quick, go ahead. Um, I think it's all about that God became a man. I think that's the whole thing. I think that's what it's all about. Um, and I believe that we can become gods. And remember, when Latter-day Saints say that, we don't believe we will be the God of evangelical Christianity. We're not Trinitarian spirits. We don't believe that. When we say we become gods, we believe that we'll have perfected bodies that will exist forever. We'll grow in knowledge and intelligence. And I would wager that every person in this room believes when they die, they'll have a perfected body and they'll grow in knowledge and intelligence. It really isn't that different. Okay. Um, so for you, Kwaku, is there any place in the Bible where God the Father has a body? Oh, or- yes. Exodus 33:11. For- Sorry, my phone is just, I don't know what's going on here. My goodness. Oh, all tender. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, 
Exodus 33, 11. The Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaketh to his friend. Um, what is Oh, goodness. I, I, I'm, I'm blanking on the scripture. You guys just Google this for me. Your gospel library. Jacob, name the place Peniel for you'd seen God face to face. Acts 7, Stephen looks up and sees God on the right, Jesus on the right hand of God. Um, so I, in, in the Bible, it's, it's very clearly laid out. It's in, it is not laid out that God is, you know, just an everywhere energy thing. It's very clearly laid out that he is a body. He walked in the Garden of Eden. It's very, very beautifully and clearly laid out. Okay. Aaron, would you like to respond to that? Well, we might as well say the Holy Spirit's a dove. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. All right. <laughs> We'll be here all night yeah, yeah, talking yeah, about this right. if I respond. Well, I, this is very good um, let's see who's this. Is. This one didn't have a name for it. Um, uh, uh, this is pretty vague here. I'm, I apologize. I can vouch for him. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm gonna, I'll rephrase it. This is for both. This, this is actually for both. So I didn't put. I didn't know I was supposed to put our name on, but it is actually okay. for, for for each of you. So I would like kind of like a summary about what you believe the scriptures teach about the difference between earth life and life in heaven. So I don't, I don't care who goes first, but I want to know like why, uh, like compare and contrast for both of for both of you. Um, so sorry. thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't care. Uh, Aaron, why don't you go first this time? Okay. Um, in this life, we see through a mirror, in a mirror, dimly, and we um, have sin. Romans 8 says that we live in a creation that's subjected to futility, and it's awaiting the freedom of the revealing of the sons of God. And so, when, first of all, Paul in Philippians says that he would rather be with Christ than be here which is pretty incredible because he wouldn't have his body. It's like a whole body amputation. He says, I'd rather be, I'd rather be with Christ than be with here. So the, the greatest thing about dying and going to heaven is what Jesus says in John 14. He's prepared houses for us or dwelling places in his father's house, I should say, just to be with the father and the Lord Jesus Christ in an intimate, personal way. And then the resurrection comes, and now we have a, a, a glorified uh, body that is immortal, will never die, and now we get to worship God in an uninhibited way, and we have our, uh, our ability to see God. Now, when I say that, I'm not thinking superficially. Uh, it's, it, it, that's, that's so superficial to me to think that this is just about what you see with your eyes. There's something about blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Or I think it's 1 John 3, uh, those who hope in God, they, their hearts are purified, even as now. And then when we, uh, w- when we see him, we shall be as he is. So I will be sinless. I will not be worthy of worship. And I will be in a position to forever be displayed the immeasurable riches of the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Quaker, anything? Uh, yes. Um, so, so can you repeat the question one more time? It was uh... a... Yeah. Oh. <laughs> May I add one more thing? <laughs> sure. Jesus talks about it in the four Gospels, and the Sadducees sort of mock him for a belief in the resurrection. <laughs> And they, uh, in their unbelief, project this life onto the next by supposing that if there was a resurrection, there would be a marriage uh, arrangement. And Jesus uh, criticizes this. He says, you don't know the power of God or scriptures. At the resurrection, we will neither marry nor be given in marriage, but we shall be as the angels, which I take to mean that it's like when you graduate high school and you look back and you're so thankful for it. Thank you, Lord, for my high school experience. I would never want to go back. Marriage is such a pitiful category for resurrection relational dynamics that it will no longer be a thing in the resurrection. The the new social life, the community, the relationships that we'll have make marriage look boring. Okay. Quaker? Um, I won't say that when I propose. Um, (laughs) Okay, so to answer your question... You're a real charmer, by the way. (laughs) Uh, Who in here has had an absolutely perfect day 
in their life. It's just a perfect day. Nothing went wrong. You were never bothered. You are never too hot, never too cold. Perfect day. No one, right? So, do, were you going to raise your hand? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think people would say that no one has ever f- felt absolutely perfect, that there's nothing else better. Um, and so I think when, when, when the scripture talks about heaven and use words like perfection and, 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 you know, eternity, none of us can really grasp that because we have never experienced it. We can really only grasp what we've experienced. We've never really experienced perfection. Um, in my theology, heaven differs from earth because... It is perfect. There is a lot that's different. Uh, we, we get to live in a state in which we'll never be sad again, never be depressed again. We'll live in a state in which we can actually understand what's going on in the universe. Um, and luckily, God's grace, it's for everyone. So will those who are covenant keepers who actually want to live with God the Father, they'll be in the celestial kingdom. Um, those who don't believe that God has a body, that you can't see him, um, that they won't be literally dwelling with him. They'll go to the terrestrial kingdom. They don't believe that they'll be living with God the Father. They don't necessarily believe we're made in his image and likeness, as it says in the scriptures. They just believe he's like a, like a thing. It's sort of like saying, right here, guys, right here, there's a giraffe. You can't see it. You can't, you can't really feel it, but I, I promise it's there. One day you'll understand what I mean by there. It's hard to explain what I mean by there, but it's there. No, no, we'll actually be with God the Father the way it says in the scriptures. We'll be with him, and being with him alone is amazing enough, but the fact that we'll be with him and we have intelligence and more things on there, God has so much in store for us. And so we just have to accept it and follow it and trust in it. But if we reject it and we we put ourselves down and we assume that it doesn't really get better, that that there is no more knowledge, that we're, we're just to be here, just to be angels... Well, I think you're missing the point. And I, the, the verse you gave, you know, it will be like angels. We, we know in, in the scriptures the word often used for God, gods and angels, is Elohim. So when you get the manuscripts, you really can translate it in, in many different ways. Joseph Smith's translation says we'll be like the gods. Okay, thank you. Um, again, I'm not quite sure. This one, I think, is for you, Kwaku. Um, uh, what would be God's motivation to share his glory, his motivation to withhold his glory? So maybe that's to share between the two of you. Yeah. Tag one thing on the last thing I just said. No marriages are given in the resurrection. Marriages are done here and then, but not in the resurrection. Marriages aren't given. We don't believe that. Anyway, so. Um, um, Great loophole. Yeah. I don't think it's a loophole. I just think it's what it says. But um, um, the, the reason why God will allow us to partake of glory um, well, you have to be honest as to what glory is. If you can't define glory, if glory is just, God has glory, and I say, what is glory? I, I can't describe it. It's not, I promise I have a personal relationship with God, and, his, and, and he has glory. I can't really describe God for you. I can't really tell you what glory is, but I promise it's there. I think that's a cop-out. I think what the scriptures lay out is that glory is having a perfected body and going for eternity. That's what it is. That's that's what it says. So I think God wants us to partake of that because we're his children. We're joint heirs with Christ. If we suffer with him, we may be glorified together. To quote Romans 8, that's that's the whole point. So God wants, uh, we are his children, and like any father or mother in here, you want your children to grow up to be like you, to be successful. You probably want to be better than you, but you know, for God you can't get better. You want them to to make it to be an adult, to, to have the wisdom you've gotten in life. And that's what Heavenly Father wants of us. So, so let me, just to make it more on point then, since he quoted Romans 8, where, where it does say, therefore God wants us as joint heirs, therefore to be glorified together with Christ, how would it mean then that we are not to share in the glory with Christ if we're being glorified with Christ? So the glory, as I take it, is a radiance of beauty. Yeah, it's, doxa is the Greek word, an, uh, right? Jesus is described as the radiance of the glory of God and the exact representation of his nature. When I, when I talk about the glory of God or glorying or glorifying, I'm talking about a display or an outward effulgence of beauty. And um, what's awesome about God's attributes and his glory 
is that he has that within himself without anyone having given it to him. So any glory or inheritance or um, honor that I'm given by God, as Romans 8 says, I'm an heir of God and a co-heir with Christ, well, it's a given glory. And what makes God different than me is that everything he has, he has it apart from having been given it. So, so God can't give me an ungiven glory. So how is that different than for Christ? If we're joint heirs with Christ, how is Christ not receiving, airing so what's, with him? what's really cool about this is it says we're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Right. And Christ never inherited Godhood. And the glory, the, the name above all names that is given to right. Jesus Christ, is suitable to a glory that he already had with the Father, Jesus says, mm -hmm. before the world existed. Right. So when Jesus is ascending to the Father, he's going back to what he already had, which is awesome. Also, when I'm raised with Christ, and, I, and I'm a co-heir with Christ, Romans 8, 29, in the same vicinity says, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. I, my inheritance is to be an adoptive sibling of Christ, who is the preeminent one. He's the firstborn He's the first one. Born. So I, I'll never be preeminent over other people. I, I, I have not inherited the being the preeminent one. I've inherited the being plugged into the preeminent one who is my head, my representative head. So the glory, any glory or inheritance I get is a derived, it's infinite, so I'll, I'll have to spend eternity appropriating it. Um, it's, uh, it's meant to glorify God, not for me to, to boast over my own future spirit children. Okay. All right. I, everything you just said, go come be a Mormon. You're almost there. That was exactly what we believe. We're not going to be right there with God, but we... That God has a glory that wasn't given to him? Um, minus that part. Uh, <laughs> um, That's like pivotal to the whole thing. Although, to be fair, though, to separate God and Jesus, I feel like is a bit disingenuous coming from any sort of Trinitarian theology because you believe they cannot be separated even a little bit. So when you say that, you know, Jesus, um, when he went back, he, you know, he, he it was even separate with the Father, I feel like... In Distinct from theology, is the language we would use. In, 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 uh, that, I, that, to me, isn't honest. Because if you believe that Jesus is God, then they can't be separate. They're one. They cannot be. Um, so I think when you really get into it, it's, it's sort of an impossible standard you're setting that no one really believes. Because when you think of God the Father and Jesus Christ, you think of them as separate because that's an inherent knowledge you have. And you have to really push yourself and confuse yourself to make them one. But it's, scriptures never lay it out that way. So... Yeah, it, just, it really is kind just of a, a matter of clarity. Uh, Trinitarian Christians believe that the Father, Son, and Spirit are three distinct, interrelating, distinguishable persons who have always loved each other in perfect love relationship for all eternity. So there's a common LDS understand, misunderstanding that tr the Trinity is modalism or three modes. No, of no, the same no, person. definitely not. Yeah. But so, so you're saying when you see God, you'll see God and you'll see Jesus. When Jesus, Jesus says, um, "If you've seen me, you've seen the Father," not to yes. make himself the Father, but that Jesus is the outworking of the yes. image. Of, he's, it says in Colossians. He's can, the, can I pull us back? Because oh, we're, sorry, we're, we're getting into a Trinitarian conversation. That's another three hours. A million so. years. Let's, uh, um, we'll take 2,000 years in a thanks. restoration yeah. to get it. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear your joke. <laughs> no one laughed except for the Mormons. It's fine. Oh, well, I, I didn't hear it. Sorry, I was busy speed reading, spud reading, so skipping every other vowel. Um, uh, this is uh, Kwaku. Uh, why do you, I love the separation here, believe in the before life, and if you do so, what do you believe? Uh-huh. Sorry. Pre-existence? Why do you believe in the pre-existence? Yeah. Might be the, a, a way to paraphrase that? Really, yeah, and, and I guess to make it topical for what we're doing here, how would the pre-existence impact uh, whether or not uh, one can become like God? Right? So. Um, so, so questions, why do I believe in the preexistence and how does it impact us becoming gods? Yeah. Okay. Um, can I share a quick story? My, my sis, I'm the only LDS person in my family. Um, my sister is not LDS. She's got beautiful, beautiful son. Um, and she was telling me a little while ago that he was mindlessly coloring. He was just coloring and uh, he was just talking the thing that kids do. They just talk mindlessly. And he says to her, you know, I don't really like it here. And my sister's like thought them and like, you know, like in her family's like, what do you mean? She goes, I don't really like it here. I liked everything before I came here. And she's sort of like, 
what do you mean before you came here? And she says, well, just everything was better before I came like here, like to this world. And so she called me. She was like, you're not going to believe what he just said. And I'm like, oh, we'll get the baptism ready. So um, I think that she should write a book. She, 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 she's <laughs> written many. Um, I got what you did there. It was clever. Um, the pre-existence is a very important part of our, of our knowledge. Um, when we believe in predestining and, and foreordaining, there's even a hint there that had, there had to be a pre. There's no existence without a pre-existence, right? There, there has to be something beforehand. Um, scripture lays it out very, very beautifully that we all existed before, and we all chose Christ. For me, this is a per very personal thing for me because knowing that everyone at one point chose Christ means that everyone has the option and the power in them to do good, to, to, to look toward God. If, if, we, if we don't have that, if there's nothing before, if God didn't know us and then just created us right as we're born, then is he really all-knowing? Does he really foreknow? If you believe there's no preexistence, then you, you weren't there before you were created, you were born. And if you weren't there before you were born, God didn't know about you, which means God isn't all-knowing. For God to be all-knowing, for him to know everything, there's got to be an existence before this earth life. That's how he foreknew us. If there, if there is no preexistence, there is no foreknowing. Okay. So, so let me restate it because there's a blank look on his face, and I would be willing to bet there's some. Did there. you guys get so, that, or was it a hodgepodge? Can, can you explain real quickly? If there is no preexistence, there is no foreknowing. Like, God doesn't have foreknowledge. Um, I'm saying if, if you did not exist at all until you were born, then... If you're saying, like, you're, like, the ultimate everything about you starts right when you're born, there's nothing beforehand, then what is there to foreknow? And if God does foreknow, then there is some preexistence there. There's a preexistent, whether it's an idea or a matter or, an, or a feeling, there is some preexistence there. And that's, I think, where the conversation begins. Not the council of heaven, but the idea that there was something that beckoned that you would exist before you were physically on earth. Okay. Uh, did, did you want to... Does that make anything? sense? Yeah. I, okay. I, <laughs> Good. And if the audience is a little confused, I, I think both of us are saying things that we, we would go to midnight addressing all the things that each other say. So we're just we're triaging here. But yeah. one of the things I would point people to is Jesus' unique preexistence in the Gospel of John. What makes Jesus different than us? Uh, very, very first verse, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And John the Baptist says, he who comes after me is more important than I am. He ranks above me because he was before me. And Jesus th says things like, you are from below, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world. And he says of uh, Abraham, before Abraham was, I am. And you get about a dozen statements in the Gospel of John that speak of Jesus having uniquely preexisted, having been sent to the world in contrast to we not having descended, but having been of this world, not having been from before, not having been there when, uh, with the Father, not having been there with, uh, with Abraham. And so if you want to know what kind of being you're dealing with when you see the person of Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John, you, you have to reckon with the fact that this is a person who existed before you were born. And when you didn't. True. So. Uh, do I, should, should I respond or should we keep going? Um, I don't know. So <laughs> it, I, I think we can probably stop there. If that, that's probably okay, right? Uh, unless yeah. unless yeah. you have something that's like going to change your life. Um, no, I, I, th I think we all so. <laughs> know what I was. I'll, I'll um, so... Uh, um, I'm going to take a little moderator privilege on, on this next question, just because otherwise it's going to get really boring on this one. Somebody asked a question, uh, Kwaku, you said that it's a historical fact, and they double emphasized that ancient Jews believed in a deification or becoming a god. Uh, what are the sources for this? I would just encourage you to come up and, and actually, you know, rather than sitting here rattling off a whole bunch of sources, I'd just say, come up and 
ask him and you know and and you can grab me or there's a couple of us that are LDS here that could probably give you a, a, a laundry list if you were so inclined so I would just encourage you to do that rather than take up a bunch of time on it's that so very very boring yeah HTTP like yeah it's not, yeah it, it's, it's honestly it's rather than waste time on, and I don't mean waste time if you really want that that it's just be not really worth going after that um, since Mormons now believe in a heavenly mother when did God marry this woman? Okay, you know, I think more, we get a lot, Latter-day Saints get a lot of questions that are very, very nitpicky. That's like me asking you, did Jesus ever eat hummus? Uh, maybe. Well, I think the spirit of the question is, did the Father have a pre-existent mortal life? When no, I, I, was... I'm getting I just think that there, there are a lot of questions that you know are nitpicky that there, there are questions anyone can ask. An atheist can ask any Christian um, did, did Jesus ever, did Jesus ever, uh, was Jesus ever angry in a way that isn't righteous? And you would say, of course not. And they would say, all right, prove it. Where does it say that? And you go, oh, I can't give you that. I mean, half of Jesus' life is, isn't really, isn't contained in the New Testament. So there are certain questions that I think are a little far-fetched um, that no one can answer. And that's totally okay. So let me, let me change this, unless you want to respond, you care. So I'm going to change this. You may not know the answer to this, I do, and so this may be unfair, right? So during the time of Solomon's temple, did the Jews ever have a statue of Heavenly Mother inside the temple? Veil? Yes. Uh, Asherah. Yeah, it's yeah, Asherah, but I mean, that's a whole, like... Even, Prophets even if, were not happy about that one. Really? Isaiah didn't... You're the moderator, man. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I, and I'm just saying, I'm just pointing out that during the entire... And Bob, years. those Jews went to hell. None of them were really Jews. They all went to hell because they believe in the Heavenly Mother. Yeah. If I can summarize the topic for, yeah, go for ahead. people. Yeah, yeah, that's um, why I wanted to bring it up. There is the a Jews. mention of Asherah in the Old Testament, and she is a pagan female deity, and uh, Mormon scholars get really excited about her. Okay. And not just Mormon scholars. All sorts of weird scholars. You could cl Honestly, you could classify... All Old Testament Judaism, you could, you could look at and say it's pagan. Yeah. I mean, the way Yahweh was influenced by El and the other surrounding gods, I mean, yeah, really when you get into it, I feel like that's just such an arbitrary, bizarre thing to say. I, I, you can always say that, oh, look at this, Judaism, ancient Judaism is so pagan. It evolved from Zoroastrianism, and that's pagan. Oh, look at this. I just feel like when you're being honest, none of those things really matter. They don't bring you closer to Christ knowing about Asher, whether she was Heavenly Mother or not. Well, there's a, there's a Mormon apologist, a fair, fair Mormon named Kevin Barney. And he wrote, a, he wrote an essay called How to Worship Heavenly Mother Without Getting Excommunicated. And it's all about Asherah. Kevin Barney, no one here knows him. He's not the prophet. I'm not Kevin Barney. That's, yeah, that's yeah. all his business. No, but I'm sorry, not to no, drag it up. No, but the only reason I, I bring it up is because um, there's actually really good archaeological evidence around this that's not LDS and, and that it was a very, it was actually a cornerstone belief of much of ancient Israel. Um, it was part of the folk Hebrew belief. Which though. seems to have led to the they were exile all wrong. of God's people. Ancient Could Jews be. were wrong. Could be. I, 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 again, I'm only bringing it up because it's not like that the Mormons invented this stuff. Right? That, that's the point. Mormons is, did not invent a heavenly mother. They're Absolutely super big fans not. of the Canaanites, though. Yeah, apparently, so were the Hebrews. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, okay, so I, I just want to throw that out since the question kind of touched on that. Um, why were the words white and delightsome in Second Nephi 30 verse 6 changed to pure and delightsome right on the heels of the civil rights campaign for blacks? Oh, good question. Um, I think that the, the church, in char the vessel in which God gives his authority on earth has the right to to clarify scriptures if they so wish. The uh, prophets liken the scriptures unto themselves. They quote other prophets and they'll sometimes change little things. We even see that in the Bible. Um, I think for, I, w I mean, I wasn't there. I would say probably for two reasons. One, it's more accurate. And two, when you're preaching the gospel, the culture of the people has a lot to do with how they're reading it. And if they're reading it in one way that says something and they sh it shouldn't mean that, the church has the right to say, okay, let's change this. No doctrine is changed. It doesn't change the meaning. It doesn't change the mission of the church. But I think it's fine. Um, changing a little bit's okay. We still love, revere the Bible. I would die for the Bible. And guess what? We know it's been changed. We, we, 
even kind of recently. So I think it's totally okay that that change happens. Do you, do you want to respond to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, the gospel is that an unworthy people, everyone, none is righteous, may be justified by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not on account of our worthiness, but on account of Christ's worthiness. And having received Christ and the Holy Spirit and eternal life and adoption through faith, not by works, we are made members of equal standing in the household of God. So, when people who claim to be apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, as they did in 1949 in the first presidency statement, when they say that people are born with black skin because of their lack of valiance and their preexistence, that actually doesn't bother me as much. It really bothers me. I think that we're wrong with that, of course. But that actually doesn't bother me as much as those same apostles saying that your worthiness has anything to do with you being a full member of the household of Jesus Christ. If I was a preexistent Aaron and I was a terrible person who rebelled against God and I was uh, brought into uh, this mortality with cursed skin, um, well, the standard for receiving full forgiveness, full eternal life, full uh, membership in God's household is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Mormon apostles got the, uh, the gospel wrong. Okay, so let me actually give the right answer on this. I apologize, Kwaku. So the right answer on this was in 1838, uh, Joseph Smith actually amended the text and uh, changed it from, uh, a pure and del- from uh, pure and delights, from white and delightsome to pure and delightsome. Uh, the plates got lost as they were, the printing plates got lost as they were transporting them across the plains to Utah. They got, and so the, the next edition, which was printed in England in 1842, uh, had the error uh, propagated in it, and that got propagated up until 1980 when, uh, when they rediscovered it, and they put it, and they put the correction that Joseph Smith had put in 1838. Uh, back into it at that point. And so the, the, the correction was actually made in 1838, and it just got lost in, uh, in, in the text. So that's the right answer, actually. So I, I, yeah, I, I still think it, it's really important that when you read something, you recognize you know, the way you're viewing it in your culture. Yeah. Um, to, to respond to that, does anyone here know what Paul said about women? Do you know? What? You know what I'm talking about? Um, women in here, whether evangelical or LDS or Catholic, um, are you silent and submissive in church next to your husbands? If you are, ra- um, <laughs> um, yeah, no, if, you, if you are silent in church, raise your hand, women. Well, first okay. of all, what does that mean? Oh, no. Uh, Paul. Let me get there. Um, do you think you should usurp authority over a man at all? No. Okay. Um, I think, I think it's important to recognize that prophets can make mistakes. No prophet has ever claimed to be perfect. And you know what? As, Just as, for clarity, you're saying Paul made a mistake with respect to gender ethics? Um, I would say that if we, if we had Paul walk in this room right now with the same views he had in the New Testament period, and we would disagree with him in many, many ways. Many, many ways. And the world is always progressing, and, and a lot of times we're, we're trying to get better. So I think he definitely held beliefs. Would you say the same thing with same-sex marriage? Um, same thing. Oh my gosh. Do we have eight hours? I think, uh, the same thing as same sex marriage. I would say that Paul would not change his mind on same sex marriage. I would, the doctrine of the LDS church is not change its uh, mind on same sex marriage. Um, I want to respond to something I think is a little more important though. As, as controversial as, you know, the, the, my church's history with, with, with blacks, with people like me, if I could go and if I could convince the, the, Protestants in America and in Europe to, if they could not allow blacks to hold their priesthood, or they could go and continue with African slavery and justifying it in the name of Christianity, I would tell them to withhold the priesthood every time. If I could make them choose between withholding the priesthood or lighting little girls on fire, accusing them of being witches, I would tell them to withhold the priesthood every single time. Um, I think having some, some controversial marks in your church's history does not make it a false church. I don't believe that's true. I don't believe that David should be excluded from the Bible because he cheated. I don't believe that's true. I think that these issues are very complex. Of course, I've thought about them more than anyone in this room has thought about them. And 
All I can say is I can't find one verse in the Bible that condemns racism by way of skin color, but I can find one in the Book of Mormon in Jacob 3.9. So I think there's a lot more to explore in this issue, and I am happy to be a Latter-day Saint, and I think I'm pretty good looking, so I'm happy to be black too. So. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so th this is more, I think this is maybe more towards you. It's, it's kind of b both of you. Quick, who asked the audience, do any of you seriously believe that God was the ultimate cause of the Holocaust? I didn't say anything because I thought the question was rhetorical, but my answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, could we ask the audience by a show of hands how many say yes and how many say no? And then maybe. Can we define cause? Because that, that word is so loaded. Yeah, I, I think that, there's, yeah, like, there's like, a, like a million. A 10 different yeah. ways to define cause. Okay. So, so, yes, there are a bunch of ways. So, did, did God um, intentionally permit it? No, 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 that's not what I meant. I meant it in the, in the true, honest way of, of predestination. Did, did God's. Did God. Did God's. <laughs> Can I speak? Did God not only permit it, but did he rejoice in it and did it glorify him? Did the Holocaust well, I, glorify well, I, God? It's not, it's not that sin itself is something that God is happy with, but it's that the plan that includes sin, but the everything whole of it, the whole, re God. the whole redemptive historical composite and mosaic of all the parts put together, God on purpose makes sure it, put, it is put together and it, it has an aim toward his glory, and that, that includes the most spectacular sins that have ever been committed in redemptive history. No, I, I, the, the, well, it was in the context of, does everything glorify God? So, Not in the same way. Okay, that's fair. Um, I, I guess we should open. I don't believe that God wanted and glor was glorified by the Holocaust in any way. I don't believe that, so you can o open he, that. He didn't, want, he didn't, in some sense, want his own son to be murdered, but in another sense, he planned it. Okay. So how many? I don't think you can compare the Holocaust to the crucifixion of Christ. I don't think you can. They're wholly different. The crucifixion, I would say, of the of the Son of God was a worse sin than the Holocaust. Um, I would say that the, the the murdering of God, yes, is is the worst thing that's ever happened. But to put the two even in the same sentence, as if the, the crucifixion gave us salvation in a way, well, it gave us someone who atoned for us, finished the atonement, we could be saved. The six million Jews dying in the Holocaust did not save anyone. That, no, no, no one has atoned for that. How do you know that God didn't have some good purpose behind it? Um, I would say there are good purposes after it. I would say many, many good things happened. But I do not believe that God specifically planned for and was glorified by Hitler carrying out those things. I don't believe that. I would not stand in front of a Jewish person and say that. I think it's disgusting. I think that if this is recorded and put online, people are going to watch that, and they're going to be sort of jarred. So the ironic, the ironic thing is that Jewish history in the Old Testament is replete with things, uh, with historical events of sins happening against the people where God explains that it was eventually for their good and for his own glory. Especially, I would say, the Assyrians and Babylonians being raised up and sent by God to judges people. That doesn't mean God is glorified by that. I think when those things happen, I think most Christians would probably agree that God lets those things happen. Uh, they meant it for evil. God meant it for good. He lets them happen, but he didn't predestine those things to actually happen. God was not glorified by the murder and burning of Anne Frank. He just wasn't. I, I, I feel like it's ridiculous and sort of insane that someone has to, in 2018, defend that. Someone has to make that cause. It's, it's very rational to know that he wasn't. And God, what? God, God, for reasons he loves, can ordain things that he hates. Okay. And he, he hated, he hated okay. the murder of Anne Frank. And for okay. reasons that he loves... Was he glorified he can, by the murder of Anne Frank? He, for reasons he loves, he ordains things that he hates. Was God glorified by the murder of Anne Frank? Ultimately, all redemptive history and all of history does. So let me ask this question then. So, so things that God pronounces as sin for humans to do are not sins for God to do. No, because God isn't sinning and he's not doing those things. He is, he is ordaining that they be without himself sinning. So, so Kwaku gave the example of the gun, which, uh, you know, which may be even a better example. And, and, and this is really, I, I apologize for intervening here, but I, I want to make a clear example, right? Sure, thank you. So, so if someone hires a, a, a person to kill their wife, didn't pull the trigger, hired someone else to pull the trigger to kill their wife, 
right? In our justice system, that person is just as guilty of first-degree murder as the assassin. So the way that God deals with humanity? But compatibilism teaches that compatibilism is the, for those that don't know, compatibilism is a, is a term in Calvinism that describes what are called secondary causes. There are causes that are not directly done by God, but they're causes that he allows to take place. Okay, right? It goes toward a great, goes toward a great definition. Yeah. Okay, and so in, in, that would be considered a secondary cause. God allowing this assassin to do the deed, in this case Adolf Hitler, to do the deed of, of killing six million Jews. Right? Putting in Hitler's heart not to love the Jews, but to let Hitler kill the Jews. Right? He did not, at any point, he could have there's stopped no Hitler. There's no puppeteering, there's no direct it, tempting, there's just no but there's agency. It, but at any point, he could There's a free-flowing willing of, the, of every human from the desires of the heart. But who puts those desires in the heart? Uh, God's not directly putting evil desires in anyone's heart. Who, who fashions the heart? According to John Calvin... Right? Calvin says that all the desires of the heart stem from God. Yeah. That's, if, if you take it to its logical conclusion, God's the ultimate and decisive cause of all things. Of all things. Uh, what does it say? What, what is the, the, where did the spirit come from um, that made Saul grab the javelin and tried to kill David? What, where does it say the spirit came from? I forget from? the it says It said the spirit which came from God came upon mm-hmm. Saul. So, um, of course, we know with the restoration, it, it says in the, in the JST, spirit which was not from God, obviously, but with that idea, with not believing in the restoration, the Bible says that God sends evil spirits to people to purposely do something bad. So I'll, I'll echo this yeah. a little bit, kind of like in Go Job. Yeah. In Go Job, uh, God uh, asks Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And uh, Satan wreaks havoc on Job's family, kills his kids. Um, all he's got left is, you know, skin with boils all over the place, and he's scraping his skin, and he's got a wife that tells him to curse God and die. And Job says, the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So we know when we zoom out that God has Satan on a leash in the book of Job, and he has prompted Satan, in a sense, like, have you considered Job? God remains completely holy in this. Job, when he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, who took away the, uh, Job's children? In one sense, God did. In another sense, Satan did. Was God sovereignly in control of the whole story of Job? Yes. You see, this is where the logic falls apart. Because when you're saying that God was not permitting sin or was not putting forth sin, and then you're saying God was in control of that sin, those two things are opposed. I don't believe that God is glorified when bad things happen. I think he's glorified and he's rejoicing when he lifts people out of those things, when they're back in heaven with them, when um, Satan's plan is turned against him. But to say that when, when someone has just been shot and they're just bleeding on the ground, or someone's, when, when a girl accused of witch is being burned alive, he's like, I am being glorified by this. I think it's ridiculous. And I think the logic that God sends evil spirit, the evil spirit which came upon Saul, we know that's not a true translation. The girl being wit, uh, burned as a witch can say with Genesis 50, 20, y'all were burning her. Y'all mean it for evil, but God means it for good. I don't think that's what she was yelling when she was being burned alive. Thank you. You know, I, I and didn't mean to gang up on you here, yeah. Aaron. How much time I do we have? I, uh, I would hate like 12 more minutes. minutes and we're done? Yep. Um, uh, so, uh, question. Hey, thank you for moderating, by the way. And yeah, thank you're you, doing Craig. a great job. Yeah, so, thanks. Um, so, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the concept of sort of arbitrary uh, assignment, I guess, in this life, so if, if, uh, if God is, is uh, selecting for his glory uh, certain people before the earth existed or b- before all creation, right? So he, uh, because it's without anything that anybody ever has done, uh, that's, uh, you know, without any influence or anything else, that is the... Unconditional de- election. Right. So that's the definition of arbitrary. No. How is that different than Arbitrary. Because it's purposeful and it has a reason and there's infinite but wisdom behind it. But it's all his it. own reason. 
Oh, yeah, it's his own reason, but right. there's, there's something. In fact, I, if I dig in a little bit, at the end of 1 Corinthians 1, yeah. um, Paul says to the Corinthian church, he's, if I may uh, paraphrase it, y'all were not smart, and y'all were not rich, and y'all were not of, uh, of great stature, and um, you were not cultural elites. Um, you were not anything special. You know? All the Texan. Well, you know, people, yeah. people add like a southern accent when they yeah. want someone to sound stupid, but um, I don't think that's true. But, but, but Paul says, you guys weren't anything special, so God chose you. God chose you. God chose what is weak in the world. God chose the less smart people. God disproportionately chooses poor people to be rich in faith yeah. so that he would be glorified and we would boast in him and not boast in our own strength. So it's not without purpose or wisdom, and it's not without um, a view of what's coming down the pipe. It's that there's nothing favorable in you or ugly in you that stops God uh, that that isn't the me- that's not the foundation of what makes God choose a person um, to be elected. Okay, and so so how can then a Latter Day Saint and uh, a Calvinist? I don't I don't, don't want to say Calvinist because I know that's not one hundred percent. But but uh, a, a Protestant know that they're saved. Were you answering? Both? Yeah, both, both, both of, of you. So how how can a Latter Day Saint and a Calvinist know that they're saved? Um. I think, well, for me, salvation, um, I, I, when I want salvation, I mean exaltation. I want to live with God the Father in, in the celestial kingdom. And the way to know that you're saved is to have your calling and elect made sure, as it says in the Doctrine and Covenants. And that can come by manifestation of the Spirit. But ultimately, if you keep the faith, if, you're, if you love God, if you follow him until the end, then you have, your calling and election has been made sure. Okay. I would say you need a temple recommend. Except that it's not yours, it's Jesus's. When Jesus ascended into heaven after having resurrected from the dead, after having paid the penalty for my sin on the cross, he earned a temple recommend. And whoever receives the Lord Jesus Christ, both a humble, childlike, empty, desperate, bankrupt kind of faith that doesn't seek to establish its own righteousness anymore, says, God, I'm bankrupt. You're everything. I'm nothing. Please give me what I don't deserve. God rushes in and he gives that person the gift of the Holy Spirit indwelling in them. And now they have an internal testimony that they're an adopted child of God. Now they grow in um, love for God and love for other people. So there's fruits that the New Testament talks about um, of obedience, especially loving other brothers and sisters in Christ, even when it's difficult. Um, So when I think about myself and I look myself in the mirror and I talk to my other brothers and sisters in Christ— and they're, they're, they're doubting their own sense of, am I really saved? Um, it's healthy to kind of go through seasons where you're like, man, I didn't, uh, I, you know, Paul says, examine yourselves, right? But I, it's, it's healthy also for brothers to look at each other and say, you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for the, for the forgiveness of your sins. You are trusting the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And we follow suit with Paul in the book of Ephesians. You have been raised with Christ in the heavenly realms. You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Uh, in Christ Jesus, and your your future your future is as good as done. You have eternal life because you have the fruits and because you have a childlike faith. So, so keep the faith. That's so so so, faith. Uh, so I, what I heard is both of you say you experience feel the Holy Spirit. So personal revelation. Both of you experience by personal revelation the sense of the Holy Spirit telling you that you're saved. Um, I think it's. I, I think that's sort of a dangerous idea. Um, there, there's this idea in a lot of mainland Christianity, at least in America and in Canada and the, the West, where you're, you're like, there's a day when you're saved. You're saved once. You feel the Holy Spirit, and you go, oh, "I'm going to heaven, brother." I think that's very dangerous. I don't think that's the way it is. I think salvation is always a process. I think discipleship is a process. It's not a one-time thing. I think to say like, "Oh, I know I'm going to heaven now," and that's that. I, I think that you're sort of putting God on a on a backpedal there i think you have to be constantly growing and increasing in faith um you have to look toward god you have to try to emulate what the savior would do in those situations you have to keep your covenants and you keep that faith until you die and as you do that you grow in a sure knowledge that god is there you have a better relationship with him Uh, but it's not like a one time and done thing so would you say you have eternal life right now I think everyone's got eternal life, but I think it depends on the In the on New Testament sense of, of the believers. Do I have eternal life right now? 
Um, I would say that I, when I, when I die, that that's going to be determined, my eternal life with God or not. Um, I would hope right now that I can look forward to eternal life, um, but I'm not God. I'm not going to go and make a decision that God would make. Why are you making a face? Oh, here, in the Aaron? book of First John, the the writer John encourages his readers uh, that they may know that they have eternal life because they have the Son. And so I, I know that I have eternal life and equal membership with all the other believers in the household of God, and I have everything that God uh, can give me is coming down the pipe. It's. Uh, I don't think I have everything God can give me because He promises. I don't, not that more. I have it. It's coming. For assuredly. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. It's in the future. So to say that, I, I mean, I think in the poetic sense I have eternal life in the way it's written in the scriptures, but to say that right now I have eternal life, like I'm not going to die, I think that's kind of silly. I know that if I were to die right now, I would be with Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father forever. And, and what I'm trying to get at with both of you, obviously, is I'm trying to figure out how much of this is an intellectual I know and how much of this is a spiritual conversion I know. If I were to die right now, I would expect to be greeted by angels and hosts of heaven and Jesus Christ. Um, and if worthy enough, then God the Father. But I know that I Do you I think you're living the celestial law that's required to be worthy enough right now? Uh, not without grace, nope. But are you? Am I, li- I don't think anyone right now is living perfectly the celestial are law. Are you living sufficiently according to celestial law such that if you died, you would be celestially exalted? I think so. I think I am right now. I think I am living um, the, the law, and I'm trusting. And if I die before the things that could happen, that need to happen to make me exalted, I believe they will happen in the next life. But I believe right now I have enough trust in the Savior and Heavenly Father that if I die, I will not be disappointed. And it's yet to be determined if you have eternal life. Like, in, in the poetic sense, I have eternal life, but in the actual, the way you're phrasing it, I thought you meant like, like you're not going to die. Like, like you in the have, New Testament sense. Okay, well, in the New Testament sense, I have eternal life, but in the way that I know that I'm going to die, and there's still going to be a judgment. I'm not usurping that authority and pretending I have authority over that. That's going to happen. Not, I'm not making that decision. So what's really cool about the Gospel of John and the New Testament in general is that the judgment that will come at final judgment has already been pronounced now on me, Jesus says in John five, whoever hears the words. So, so no one. So this also gets into so no one can ever lose their salvation. Well, let me just finish the passage. Whoever hears the words, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me, he has it, eternal life. He has passed from death to life. I just also believe there's choice, and I believe that many, many people in this world have thought that they've chosen God and they felt it so much, and then they did wicked things and then they fell, and that happens. So I would agree. There's a lot of I false converts. I do. For me personally, I don't like to take it upon myself and make myself the deciding factor. I only leave that up to God. That's why I don't tell other believers that they're not Christians or anything like that, because I am not Jesus. I am not God. I don't take that authority. I'm not even an apostle. Um, I believe the scriptures are, are conveying a message, but I still believe there is a judgment, and we should not take that authority away. Okay. Can we clap for... Bob, for uh, participating with the moderation. moderation. Thank you, Bob, for doing the moderation. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks so much for coming. Appreciate it.